Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, Frozen Ever After, Sword Around the World, and more. Today, I'm spilling all the best kept secrets about Epcot's most popular attractions. I bet even the biggest Disney buffs don't know all these. Hey everybody, it's Molly with Mammoth Club, and today I'm taking you with me as we have a fabulous day around Epcot, and we ride some of their most popular attractions. And along the way, I'm going to be spilling the details, the secrets, the backstory, the hidden things that you don't know about these attractions that make them so, so great. Let's get to it. We got a lot to do. We're going to kick this video off with the beacon of Epcot herself, the oldest attraction on the list, Spaceship. Earth. I mean, did you really even come to Epcot if you don't go inside the big golf ball? Speaking of the big golf ball, if you were to use the proportions of this 180-foot geodesic spear, you'd have to be 1.3 miles tall to hit it as a golf ball. Anyone else do a Spaceship Earth outfit check when you walk by here, or is that just me? Please tell me I'm not alone. And before we talk about the attraction Spaceship Earth, we gotta talk more about the structure. For starters, people said it would be impossible to make a geodesic sphere that hangs in the air this way until legendary Imagineer John Hench, who is also responsible for designing Space Mountain, figured out that if they basically cut the sphere in half and had a table in between the two of them, then the bottom portion of Spaceship Earth could be hanging and the top could be supported by the beams. I'm not an engineer, I don't really understand how engineering works, but what you need to know is that John Hench is a genius and he's the one who figured out how to make this structure. Also the structure has over 11,000 of these triangles on it, and if you look closely you can actually see that there's a gap between every single triangle, it's about an inch thick. That is actually a rain gutter system, so if it's pouring down rain you can stand under Spaceship Earth and you won't get wet. And the rain is collected and funneled into World Showcase Lagoon out there um, so they can reuse the water, which we love that, we love environmentality around here. But as big and impressive as Spaceship Earth is, it's not even the biggest thing here at Epcot. The real crown goes to the seas, the aquariums at the seas. That aquarium is so big that if you were to siphon an inch of water off the top of all of the tanks, it could fill Spaceship Earth. And Spaceship Earth, the structure, could actually fit inside the tanks. That's how big it is over there. So, wow. So. But hey, you know what? Let's ride Spaceship Earth, a classic, a must-do, in my opinion, when you're at Epcot, and learn a little bit more about it. Spaceship Earth, despite being one of the most iconic and beloved and popular attractions here at Epcot, it usually doesn't have too long of a line. So this is one that you can hop in standby and not wait too long, like right now it's a posted 15 minute wait. It does sometimes get a longer line in the mornings just because people kind of walk into the park and they're like, oh look, I'll ride, and they get in line for it. But usually around noon-ish it dies down and it's got a pretty manageable queue. Of course, during the busiest times of the year it may jump up and you want to use a lightning lane here, but uh, if you're using Genie Plus in Epcot, this is not one that you typically need to prioritize. A couple more cool things about Spaceship Earth and the actual structure itself. As you can imagine, the structure inside is very complex and complicated and there's a lot of different walls throughout both the globe portion and the rest of the ride show building. And it's so confusing that at times the maintenance team and the engineering team gets lost. So one thing the maintenance team and the engineers will do is actually draw on the wall with pencil as kind of a leaving breadcrumbs to find your way back path. They will follow their own pencil marks to get back to the entrance and not be lost inside Spaceship Earth. Additionally, there's a secret trap door on the very tippy top of Spaceship Earth that's used for the engineers and the, and the team to go maintain the top of Spaceship Earth. And occasionally, you may remember it was used for promos where Mickey would stand on top of it. A couple of things to look for while you're riding Spaceship Earth. One, Disney famously reuses audio animatronic faces. It's a lot easier to put different hair, costumes, etc. on a face that they've already made from, say, Hall of Presidents. Uh, than it is to create all new faces. So you'll actually see a lot of U.S. presidents hiding amongst the uh, animatronics here. But my favorite reused face is not actually one of the presidents. It is John and the daughter from Carousel of Progress. They're in the Renaissance theme. Look for them on the right-hand side playing the lute and the, uh, the mandolin. Very fun. And for all you Hidden Mickey fans out there, a.k.a. everyone that's not Max, um, on the left-hand side in that same scene, there's a Hidden Mickey on the desk. Spaceship 
Perth. One of the best. Always so fun. Just classically Epcot. We must take a selfie with the uh, bubblegum wall. Bubblegum wall ears. Hang on. Did that. A great selfie spot. We can do an Insta series on the best selfie spots, like how to take the best pictures around Disney World. Let me know if that is content you want. Um, a couple things about Spaceship Earth. One, there's another hidden Mickey that's like incredibly, incredibly hard to see, and I tried to get it on camera, but it's almost impossible. In the room with the sassy scientist lady, my favorite character on Spaceship Earth, there are three coffee mugs on the desk, and on the back side of one of them is a Mickey sticker, but you can only see it if you turn around and look in the mirror behind you. Boggles the mind, doesn't it? I also always like to look at the little newspaper boy who's facing the wall and shouting at the wall to get the newspapers. And it makes me wonder why. It makes a lot of people wonder why in the Disney community. Some say that his face melted during a refurbishment of the attraction. Some say he annoyed the Imagineers. Who's to say? But that is a fun Disney legend uh, that the Dis Disney community likes to talk about. From one of Epcot's oldest attractions to the newest, it saved the galaxy time, baby. We're headed to Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind next. As we walk over here, let's talk about how you can ride Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Because, of course, it's not as simple as just, you know, standing in a line. It's got a virtual queue right now, which I do like because it makes your time in line very, very short. However, it's very confusing and complicated uh, if you haven't done your research. So, basically, the only two ways to ride Cardi Cardians, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, my goodness, is either by purchasing a fancy ride or by doing the virtual queue. Fancy rides are an individual cost not associated with Genie Plus. Resort guests can buy them at 7 a.m. day of, and non-resort guests can buy them at the time that park opens. Typically, this attraction runs from $14 to $17 per person. Additionally, there is the virtual queue, which opens up at 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. most days. You have to have an Epcot reservation to book the 7 a.m. one, and you have to be inside the park to book the 1 p.m. one. So either way, you pretty much have to have an Epcot reservation to book Guardians of the Galaxy's virtual queue. The way it works is that prior to 7 a.m., one hour beforehand, so starting at 6 a.m., you can confirm your party. I highly recommend doing this. You don't have to get up right at 6 a.m., but before 7 a.m., confirm your party Make sure that everybody's got an Epcot reservation and all linked up so that way, right at 7 a.m., you are gonna hit the refresh button on the virtual queue screen or pull down and then click join the queue. You have to be incredibly fast because the spots at 7 a.m. go very, very quickly. I'm talking within seconds. The spots in the 1 p.m. queue tend to last a little bit longer, but that's the only ways to ride this attraction right now. I also want to note that on days where there are extended hours here for deluxe and villa guests, they offer another virtual queue at 6 p.m. so that you can ride it during the after hours. My best tip is use another phone or device to have a world clock counting down and click refresh. Start clicking refresh as soon as you see 6.59.59. Be lightning fast and hopefully you'll get a queue spot. Once you've joined the virtual queue, you will get a push notification as to when it's your turn to ride. You can also check on your phone the status of the virtual queue or on boards throughout the park. When you get that push notification, they'll give you a time window to come back. It's usually about an hour, and then you can come back and, and ride the ride with minimal weight, which is great. You are allowed to book both one virtual queue and buy the fancy ride if you'd like to ride it twice. You are not allowed to book both virtual queues. Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind is a roller coaster. It's a first of its kind with, they're calling it an Omni coaster because the vehicles can spin a full 360 like an Omni mover. Vehicles such as uh, Haunted Mansion or Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger spin. So they can turn you to uh, show you different parts of the show elements uh, within the attraction. It does make a lot of people very nauseous, so I'm just letting you know that now. I haven't had a problem with it. Um, however, some people find it very nauseating. It never spins a full 360 like the teacups or anything, uh, but something about the movement and the screens do make some people nauseous. 
It has a 42 inch height requirement um, and there are six different songs you could get. So that's part of the fun is not knowing which song you're going to get. And they announced that they're going to do Christmas songs this holiday season. Uh, I'm so excited about that. I can't wait to see which songs they use. I'm predicting maybe a little Wham! Last Christmas. Uh, maybe a little bit. I would love if they did like the Jackson 5 Christmas album. Very excited about this. The first thing you'll want to watch when you're in the queue is here in the Galaxarium. Uh, you're going to want to listen to her as she talks about the difference between Terra, which is Earth, and the galaxy. At the end of the spiral arm of your Milky Way is a star which you call Sun. She makes a lot of interesting jokes about Peter Quill, and she talks about things like turkey legs and mixtapes, so it's very interesting to hear. The plot of this attraction is that much like there are different country pavilions in Epcot's World Showcase, this is the first interplanetary pavilion here, and the planet of Xandar, the home of the Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, is inviting us to view Xandar and learn more about them, and maybe we'll learn that Xandar and Terra, Earth, aren't that different but of course things go awry one thing i love about this attraction queue which you do miss out by the way if you go through the lightning lane you don't get the whole gallery experience um, but there are a lot of nods to walt disney himself in fact if you watch long enough walt will actually pop up on one of the screens talking about progress city and the zandarians say that they're pleased to have designed their city similar to the way that one of our humans would have, which is, of course, Walt Disney. So it's really cool that he pops up. There's also this incredible model of Xandar City, uh, which is very reminiscent of the one inside Carousel of Progress, which is a model of Progress City, which is Walt Disney's original idea for Epcot. I'm just glad we have some nods to Walt in here throughout the queue area, because Epcot was one of Walt's passion projects. So it's fun to see him him talked about in this way. There's also a hidden Mickey on the map right here. If you look kind of in this corner, some of the structures down on that grass make a hidden Mickey. I love this little detail about the Zendarian Nova Corps uniforms. If you look at the bottom at the lowest, the corp corpsman, the core man, he has one line and then it adds another line and so on and so forth until you eventually make the entire star. As you weave around here, you will see that they are showing an episode of Good Morning Xandar, which is Good Morning America, and they interview the Guardians about their heroic save from the first film, but listen closely to what Peter Quill says. Tara was chosen for this Wonders of Xandar tour. Well, that was totally my idea. And that guy, too, because I love that place. It's awesome. I went there as a kid, and I can't wait to get to go back and ride horizons. Also want to see the energy, dinosaurs, and of course, here the veggie veggie fruit fruit. I mean, it's the best. Can't wait. <laughs> okay. Who's gonna tell him? His ride replaced Universe of Energy, so awkward. A couple of my favorite details in the pre-show. Number one, Isan is the villain here. You're see, you see him briefly in the first Guardians movie. He's a celestial, which they talk about more in the Eternals. But when Isan says this species has failed, pay attention to Rocket and Groot because Rocket goes, and it makes me laugh every time. This species has failed. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. We didn't even know there was a test. He's got the cost of generating. Additionally, when Rocket explains his plan, the logo for this attraction of Pavilion is drawn out. Come on, it's me! You got this! We're all toast! First there was cake, now there is toast. This plan is making me so hungry. So every Epcot Pavilion has a different circular logo. Um, you can see the flags outside Epcot have all of them on there, um, but you can see it on Rocket's little iPad thing. You can see the logo for the Energy Pavilion, which is cool. And speaking of energy, this attraction replaced Universe of Energy, which became Ellen's Energy Adventure. So there's some really fun nods to the predecessor within the attraction. The first big one is that when uh, Glenn Close's character is talking, she talks about how the Big Bang um, united our two planets. Your world and ours were born of the same moment, one which you refer to as the Big Bang. 
and the Big Bang is a huge focus within Universe of Energy, so that's one of the best Universe of Energy Easter eggs. A couple more to look and listen for. One, when you take off backwards on the attraction, um, they say that you're going back to the Big Bang. And Drax, if you listen, goes, the ding dang, and they say, no, the Big Bang. That is a quote directly pulled from the script between Ellen and Bill Nye, the science guy. Additionally, on the attraction, when you see the Celestial, the Guardians roll up in the uh, in their ship, and if you listen closely to what song they're listening to, it's a rock and roll version of the Universe of Energy theme song. What is that noise? Noise? No one's gonna stop rock and roll from existing. Maybe my favorite detail on the entire attraction. There's also a really cool nod to certain people from the uh, Ellen's Energy Adventure down in the load area we're gonna go check out right now. This next Easter egg is incredibly hard to see, but I promise it's there. Here's a picture taken in night mode. It's super cool, but on these two columns right here, there are four different words uh, in the Xandarian alphabet. Those four words translate to English as Ellen, Alex, E equals MC, and Dino, which are nods to Ellen DeGeneres, of course, Alex Trebek, rest in peace, who is in the attraction. E equals MC, they talk about Einstein as part of the Jeopardy game, and Dino, because the ride famously featured dinosaurs. You can row request on the attraction. A lot of people that get motion sick like to ask for row one. Row nine is obviously the most wild, but for me, row five is my favorite, especially if it's your first time. Row five is the one the Imagineers told me is the best row to take in the most amount of the show happening all around you. So if you, uh, if you wanna know what to ask for, I say go row five. Uh, you may have to wait off to the side right here in this little waiting area for a, a car, but you'll be able to ride it. And uh, that's my favorite spot. Okay, they're headed for the jump point. This plane is never gonna work. Rocket! It was useless to follow me. What is that noise? Noise? No one's gonna stop rock and roll from existing. We have no room in our ship for these new Drax, it's an honorary title. They're not going to... The whole point of this is that it's a pavilion, much like the World Showcase pavilions, but because things went awry, you end up landing backstage. So you might see a few things that you're not supposed to. Most notably right over here. Right here you have this mirror that you can take a cool selfie in, but the point of this mirror, they have these for real when you are a cast member going on stage. And so it's so that you can check your uniform, that you've got your name tag on, that you look okay. Here's the rules. For the Disney look, if you were to translate it, they are reminding you to look good and smile because you're headed back on stage. To clarify, Disney speak, backstage is anywhere that guests aren't allowed, on stage is anywhere guests can see you and are allowed. The whole thing's a show, that's why it's cast members, not employees, you get it. But man, do I love that attraction. That attraction is so, so good. It is worth the hype, it's worth the hassle of trying to get into the virtual queue. I got conga if you were curious. Absolutely adore it. I love it. One of my top five favorite rides in Disney World now. From one of my favorite attractions in Walt Disney World to one of my least favorite attractions in Walt Disney World, it's time to ride Test Track. And yeah, I did just give Test Track that much shape. I just think this ride's really overrated. I drive in a car faster than these vehicles. There's a hundred minute wait right now? No! No, but you know what? Still gonna give you some good fun facts. And you know who loves this ride? Kids. Kids that can't drive a car love this ride. It's incredibly popular, people ride it all the time, so it deserves some fun facts. Test Track has a 40 inch height requirement and it is the fastest ride in Walt Disney World going at 65 miles an hour. But did you know the Imagineers wanted it to go 95 miles an hour? However, I will say if it went 95 miles an hour, I may like it a little bit more. Test Track allows you to design your own simulator car and then put it to the test on the sim track. One thing I do like about this attraction is that you can compete with your friends and family on who can build the best car and my competitive spirit really enjoys that. Test Track is very popular, therefore it usually has a pretty long line. 
It does have single rider, which I recommend using um, as if you're by yourself or you don't mind splitting up. I also recommend booking this one as a lightning lane. If you are using Genie Plus, it tends to go pretty quick throughout the day. Not quite as fast as Remy's on a two adventure, um, but probably second tied with Frozen Ever After. First detail I'm gonna point out before we even go inside is that on the specialty test track trash cans, here's the logo for World of Motion. Remember I said each pavilion at Epcot has their own logo and World of Motion was the original attraction where Test Track is. So it's fun that they've got the logo right there. One thing you should know about Test Track if you want to ride it is that she's an incredibly temperamental attraction. There are a lot of downtimes with this ride. It was down for like several hours earlier today. It goes down for weather because of lightning and it often just doesn't want to work so it usually opens late uh, and it may have a downtime throughout the day so keep that in mind too that doesn't help with the wait times one thing about the single rider line is that you get to still choose a car but it's not going to be from the ground up you can see here they're building their cars as part of the pre-ride experience that's the regular queue or the lightning lane and you actually get to pick the colors and customize the wheels and put graphics and things on your car However, like I said, this line gets very, very long and it's worth it to me to skip through that section to get on the ride faster. This single rider line does tend to move pretty quick because they're filling in odd numbered seats. You sit in rows of three and anytime you're filling in an odd number, it's more likely that you'll have a spot as opposed to an even number because most people come in groups of two and four. Also, I just really missed the OG version of this ride. I thought it was better. A couple of cool details to look for when you're actually on the attraction. Number one, in the efficiency room, there's actually a URL code uh, in some of the coding that you'll see. If you were to type that URL into a browser, it actually pulls up a hidden Mickey, making it probably my favorite hidden Mickey of all time. Additionally, there's some more nods to Progress City in this attraction. When you go through the brake test, you'll look on uh, to the left-hand side and there is a Progress City model. It's neon and glowy. And again, that's a nod back to Walt's original idea for Epcot. Lastly, when you head out on the track, there are a couple of nods to both Progress City and World of Motion. The street signs, one of them is an image of Progress City and one of them is fun to be free. And that was the theme song to World of Motion. For your safety. Remain seated with your seatbelt fastened and your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Just not my fave, but you know what? If it's your fave, that's all good. We can all have different faves. And speaking of faves, headed to one of the biggest fan favorite franchises. That's right, it's time to ride Frozen Ever After. Welcome to the fictional city of Arendelle, located in the real country of Norway. This is Frozen Ever After. This is the boat ride that replaced Maelstrom, the original attraction here. Of course, Disney was gonna build a Frozen themed attraction and it just so happened to fit very nicely here uh, in the Norway Pavilion. But what are some things you can look for? Well, you don't have to look too hard, uh, go too far to find the first one. If you look up there, you've got a little model of an ice maker. Ice maker? Ice harvester? Anyway, he may look familiar to you if you're a Frozen fan. One of the coolest things about Frozen Ever After as a theme park nerd is this is the first attraction that Disney used fully electric audio animatronics. So the way audio animatronics worked before, if you think about classics such as Hall of President, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, Carousel of Progress, etc., where you're going to have human audio animatronics, the way it worked before is they had to have an electric bolt send the charge. I don't understand engineering that much, so this is my very 
level one understanding of it, um, but they had to have an outside source send the charge to the different body parts to make it move. So you often saw a little bit of jerkiness in the motion, especially if you look at older ones, still incredibly impressive. But these audio animatronics are self-contained, which is why their uh, motions are so fluid, which is why they can do things like have Elsa cross her arms at the same time. That would not be possible the old way they did audio animatronics. So even if you're not a Frozen fan, if you're a tech nerd, if you're a Disney history nerd, it's very cool to see these animatronics. And as an extra fun fact there, you know which one of the hardest one to make was? It was Olaf. I know a lot of people think it might be one of the princesses or Sven, but Olaf was the hardest because he's the smallest. So they had to fit the same amount of technology in an animatronic that was half the size of the other ones. Olaf and Sven are also my favorite animatronics here because they don't use the projection mapping for the faces. I understand that's very cool technology and it looks great, but I prefer just like the old school model versions. Speaking of the faces, they worked not only with the original cast, Adina Menzel, also known as Adele Dazeem, Kristen Bell, Josh Gett, as well as Jonathan Groff. And they all came in to record their own singing voices and their own voices for this attraction. But that's not all. Disney Imagineering worked very, very closely with the animation studio to make sure that the emotions portrayed on the characters' faces, the arm movements, um, were very, very fluid and very similar to what you would have seen in the story. So we love a collab. We love that uh, Imagineering worked with animation to make this one of the most popular and beloved franchises into an attraction. Frozen Ever After is certainly one of the most popular attractions. For starters, it's a great family ride. You know your kids as well as you love Frozen. I don't care if you don't want to admit it or not, you love the song Let It Go. And because of the popularity of the attraction combined with the low capacity of the attraction and how long it takes to load and unload people in the boats, the lightning lane goes very quickly and the standby line gets very, very long. For example, it's a 110 minute wait right now in the standby line. When Genie Plus first rolled out, this was considered a fancy ride. However, it is part of the $15 Genie Plus attractions at now. I would recommend booking this one either first or second. Uh, Remy's Attitude Adventure tends to be the most popular of them now. So I personally booked Remy first and this one second when I was booking things today. But if you're not interested in Remy, I would book this one first. Another great idea is that if you book Remy, rope drop this one as uh, most people rope drop Remy. So that's another great way to get on this one. This is definitely a tricky one as far as the queue goes because from the outside it doesn't look like it's going to be 110 minutes. But when you get in here and see how many people are packed inside, it definitely will be. Much like Test Track and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, there are nods to the predecessor within the queue and within the attraction. The first, if you're in the standby line, you're going to go through Oaken's little shop over here, and there's a wood carving of a polar bear standing on its hind legs, which is a nod to the polar bear that used to be in Maelstrom. The second one I'll point out, once you're on the attraction, after you go down the waterfall with the snowman, look on the right-hand side and you will see some Arctic puffins. Those puffins are left over from Maelstrom. Those same animatronics were used on that attraction, and they survived and made it here to Frozen Ever After as well. I do think that is just such a cute attraction. I love a classic Disney dark ride, whether that be an Omni Mover or a boat. And when you just put me inside of a Disney story with the music and the animatronics, I just love it. It's just quintessentially Disney to me. So that one again gets very long lines. So plan accordingly if you want to go to Aaron. A little pro tip about Frozen Ever After. On that little waterfall, it tends to get people wet, but it tends to get you the most wet if you're sitting on the outsides. That's the great thing about being alone. I can sit right in the middle. So mom and dad, put your kids on the outsides. Kids don't care about getting wet. Sacrifice them to the water. Bonjour, friends. We have made it all the way to France to tackle the second newest at this point attraction here in Epcot. Of course, we are going to go visit our friend Chef Remy at Remy's Ratatouille Adventure. Remy's Ratatouille Adventure officially opened on October 1st of last year for the 50th anniversary. And it wasn't just Remy's that opened. There was this whole expansion to the France Pavilion, which includes new very fancy restrooms, as well as the new creperie. There's a walk-up window, as well as a sit-down restaurant here where they've got both sweet and savory crepes. But of course, the real star of the show back here is the new attraction. If you are a fan of Ratatouille the movie, I think you're going to adore this new area and the ride itself. There are lots of great hidden details. Now, this is another family attraction. There's no height requirement. It is in 3D, so it does make some people nauseous because of the screens. 
it's not too too bad for me i think because you're moving through practical sets as well as looking at screens it's not like star tours where you're just sitting in one place and shaking around it's more like a less intense version of like transformers or spider-man over at universal but again it's a family attraction let's go check out some of these cute little ready details that make this area so magical for starters, if you look at this plaque outside one of the buildings here, uh, it is for Nadar Lassard, who is a public health inspector. You may remember that the rats all tie him up and lock him in the uh, food pantry. Yes, that is Lassard. So his office was right down the street from the restaurant. Another one of my favorite details in the standby queue, if you look down in the two corners, you will actually see some Remy and other rat footprints running off back towards the kitchen to go help out. I wish we could go inside, but closer to the attraction, you will see La Cave de Ego. I, I can't pronounce anything in French, I'm so sorry, but you may remember uh, Ego was the food critic in the film, and it looks like he's opened up a little wine shop, which is lovely. And he's got a couple of signature blends, and you'll notice they are from the years 2007, 2014, and 2021. Those are the years that the film Ratatouille came out, that Remy's Ratatouille Adventure opened in Disneyland Paris, and that Remy's Ratatouille Adventure opened here in Epcot, respectively. Additionally, if you take a look at the anchovies right here, you'll notice they're called Gusto. A few other things to notice in the courtyard area. One, you'll notice that a lot of things in this part of the France Pavilion are not straight, they're crooked. That was developed by one of the animators at Pixar. It's called Crookedology, and it gives the entire area more of a cartoony feel versus the original part of the pavilion. So look at the smokestacks, look at the pipes, and you'll notice that they are crooked. And it's really cool that the Imagineers took the design style from the film and made it come to life here in the pavilion. Additionally, probably the most famous thing about this attraction, or at least outside the attraction, is this gorgeous fountain with the popping champagne bottles and little cute Remy up at the top. The Imagineers had to actually develop a brand new type of water filter to make it look like these were popping champagne bottles and not just shooting straight water up into the air. I love this little hidden Remy as well. He's on the sewer grates here. And you can see he's specifically from the beginning of the movie when he's on Gusto's cookbook paddling through with a broken spatula through the sewers that eventually leads into Gusto's restaurant. Damn it! When Remy's Ratatouille Adventure first opened up, it had a virtual queue and it was a fancy ride. Now it is neither. It has a regular standby queue that anyone can join. It's a hundred minutes right now. It does get very, very long. Or it is part of Genie Plus. If you are using Genie Plus, this is what you should use as your 7 a.m. selection because they do tend to sell out for the day. They will pop up from time and time again, but of all the Epcot attractions, this one tends to go the fastest. This is also probably the most popular attraction to rope drop. So again, my best Epcot scenario is to book this one first on Genie Plus and then rope drop uh, either Test Track or Frozen Ever After, whichever one of those is more important to you. On Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, you are being shrunk down to the size of the rat to go through Gusto's kitchen. Just like in the film, you'll see some familiar faces. Of course, Remy, Ego, Chef Skinner, Gusto. It's a very, very cute attraction. And in my opinion, what World Showcase needed, they needed another family attraction. And I think this fits the bill perfectly. Another very cute detail is the wallpaper. It's got all kinds of little hidden things in it. Look, there's a meal and Remy, the Eiffel Tower, cheese salt and pepper shaker silverware adorable when you go through the lightning lane you do skip this cute little artist studio but you still get to see the rooftops with the gusto sign and what perfect timing because i was about to tell you that chef gusto does come to life he's got a few different sayings like <laughs> My favorite is the one we just saw because he holds up his pans to make Mickey ears or Remy ears when he talks about Chef Remy. And my favorite detail to look for on the actual attraction in the first main scene when you're on the rooftop with Remy before you fall into the kitchen, look to the right hand side and in the window you will see the Pizza Planet truck, which is an Easter egg that they put into every single Pixar movie. So I love that they also put it into this Pixar attraction. <laughs> Chef Remy is waiting for you this way.
I just think all the oversized things in here are so cute, like the Christmas lights above, and the leaves, and then you will return your glasses and you know when you are shrinking or growing to the size of a human again, because look at the tile when you're the size of a rat, and then look at the tile when you're the size of a human again. And as you leave, another little thing you can take a photo with, you've got Chef Skinner's little moped as well as Colette's motorcycle parked outside here, and you're welcome to jump aboard and grab a pic. That ride honestly gets cuter every time I ride it. I notice new things. I love things like the big wheels actually turning when you're on the food uh, cart. I love that there are screws in the wall holding in the air conditioner like duck things and you see the back side of the screws since you're hiding in the walls. I think it's a very cute attraction. Wouldn't wait 100 minutes for it though. So if you want to ride this one, definitely use some Genie Plus or uh, come early or late is a great choice. But now we must say au revoir to France and it's on to our final attraction of the day. We're back in not future world for our final attraction of the day. I know there are more attractions at Epcot, ones that we love, but they're not exactly the most popular attractions. But hey, we could do a part two if you want. We can do a part two. I will never get sick of sharing hidden details and Easter eggs. These are some of my favorite things to talk about. But of course, we are ending this video with everyone's mom's favorite ride inside the land pavilion where you'll find the globe surrounded by the four seasons with these hot air balloons there's one for spring summer autumn and winter this is also where you have living with the land sunshine seasons garden grill but there's only one attraction that could be everyone's mom's favorite and it's soaring around the world seriously if this is your mom's favorite attraction or you're a mom and this is your favorite attraction let us know because this is certainly my mom's favorite attraction and uh, she makes us ride it multiple times every time she visits, which is fine by me because it's a great attraction. What if my mom's favorite attraction was like Cali River Rapids? Wouldn't that be terrible? Good thing she's a lady of good taste. You may remember that when this attraction debuted, it was not soaring around the world. It was soaring over California because the original of this attraction debuted in Disney California Adventure. So you soared over iconic places throughout the state of California. But now it is soaring around the world, so you'll soar over things such as the Taj Mahal, the Great Wall of China, Paris, the pyramids, and it's a delight, I tell you what. The first Easter egg I'll point out is you may notice it's Soarin' Flight 5505. It is always Soarin' Flight 5505 because this attraction opened up on May 5th of 2005. Soren tends to ebb and flow a little bit more than some of the other popular attractions here. For example, right now it only has a 20 minute wait. Earlier today it had a 90 minute wait. So if you have Genie Plus, it's a pretty easy one to snag compared to some of these other attractions we've been talking about, but it's definitely not a top priority because you can usually get on it with a 30 minute wait or less without Genie Plus. This attraction has a 40 inch height requirement and you're gonna be hand gliding around iconic places in the world. What's very interesting about this attraction is it was actually developed by using an old toy. The Imagineers were trying all these very complicated different strategies to try and make this attraction come to life and none of them were working out. However, one weekend, Imagineer Mike Sumner was playing with his kids in an old Erector set. And he took a look at it and he realized this could be the very simple technology they could use to make Soren come to life. I think one of the reasons people love this attraction so much is the iconic score. It's absolutely beautiful, and it was composed by award-winning composer Jerry Goldsmith. You may know his work because he also scored Mulan, The Mummy, Alien, Omen, Planet of the Apes, Poltergeist, the Star Trek movie, and, ironically, one of the opening fanfares for Universal Pictures. A great detail not a lot of people notice here in the queue is that these lights are actually supposed to represent clouds which is why sometimes they're dim, sometimes they're bright, because it's supposed to be the clouds blocking out the different spots of the sun. Oh, I just love this attraction. Soren also has one of my favorite pre-shows, probably because it's presented by Patrick Warburton, who I have a real kinship with for some reason. Hey, how come people don't have dip for dinner? Why is it only a snack? Why can't it be a meal, you know? But some of his lines, like, nice work, pal, 
are very iconic in the, the Disney nerd community, so this is one of my favorites. If you want the best seat on Soren, make sure you ask for B1, because you'll be right in the middle, no one will be above you. I did not ask for B1, so it's got got to get to getting after this, so I didn't have time to wait, but if you want the best flight, B1 is where it's at. These little beauties. A couple of things to look for on the attraction. There is a very good hidden Mickey. Sorry, Max, I'm gonna keep telling them. Uh, when you get to the sea with the hot air balloons, look towards the right a little bit and three hot air balloons align to make a hidden Mickey. Another thing to look for is the castle. That is the castle in Germany that inspired Cinderella Castle. It's just such a relaxing and enjoyable attraction. It's one that when my family comes, everyone from the youngest who's tall enough to ride up to my grandparents love that one. It's also the only ride I've ever been on that people clap at every single time at the end. And I go on a lot of rides, but there's just something special about Sora. Well, hopefully you learned something about one of these six popular Epcot attractions that you didn't know before. Let me know what your favorite Epcot ride is down in the comments. In the meantime, friends, make sure to like, follow, subscribe, follow us on social media at Mammoth Club. Ring that notification bell. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly. It's been magical. Now go watch the Animal Kingdom version of this video. Bye!